Please turn with me to the book of Isaiah, or in American, Isaiah uh, chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. I'm going to obviously move away from Luke this morning. We'll go back to Luke again next week. I have a very heavy message on my heart this morning. I did speak from Isaiah 8 right at the beginning of the pandemic about 18 months ago. In fact, I think it's exactly 18 months ago that um, we touched on some aspects of Isaiah chapter 8. <clears throat> but I want to revisit the passage because I believe that it is particularly pertinent and relevant to us today. And so let's read from Isaiah 8 verses 11 through the end of the chapter. Isaiah 8 verses 11 through 22. Isaiah 8, 11, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that, is, that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare in the, in, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me, we are for signs and wonders in Israel, for the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they say, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. And it shall happen, when they are hungry, that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God, and look upward. Then they will look to the earth, and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. We looked very briefly at some aspects of this verse in our study on the book of Hebrews a couple of weeks ago, because part of this chapter is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2. The, the passage is, deals with Israel, and I'm going to sketch the background for you in a moment. The problem in reading the Old Testament is that we tend to read it as pertaining to Israel, or to Judah, or to the people in the Old Testament. And yet, the book of Corinthians in chapter 10 tells us that these things were written for our admonition, for our warning, upon whom the ends of the earth have come. And so, the whole point of the Old Testament, which makes up almost two-thirds of our Bible, and which we glibly ignore, but the, the whole point of the Old Testament is, is twofold. First of all, it speaks of Jesus. Jesus says, you search the Scriptures, they speak of me. But secondly, they are a warning to the church as to the potential of apostasy and the dangers when people turn away from their God. And so as we look at Isaiah chapter 8, it contains some very, very powerful warnings to the time in which we're living. I am absolutely convinced that what Isaiah is saying to Israel, uh, to Judah, he is saying to the church in the world at large and to America in particular today. The state of Israel and of Judah at that time is the state of the church today. The warnings to them are the warnings to us today. When you look at these things and when we speak about these things, it's easy to speak hypothetically without mentioning names. And this is where my wife begins to cringe. I'm going to name names this morning. Because the problem is that we read these things and we say, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. But in our minds, we turn it to whatever way we choose to. And I believe that there is a particular point that I need to make this morning. This has been heavy on my heart for weeks now. 
I have not slept for the last two nights as I have wrestled with God over this message. I don't like to preach these kinds of messages, but I believe that they are important. I understand also that, this is, that what I'm speaking about this morning is not a particular problem in our congregation. But it is a problem in all of evangelicalism in America, and including Pentecostal and Charismatic churches. And not only in America, but it affects people in the rest of the world. We, we've, we've heard that saying that when, when America coughs, the rest of the world catch a cold. That is true. Many years ago when I was a young preacher, 50 years ago, the older men used to say to me at that time, you need to keep an eye on America because what happens in America will come to South Africa. It just takes five years. Well, that was before the internet. Now it doesn't take five years, it takes five seconds. What happens here instantly spreads across the rest of the world and affects the church in the rest of the world. And so the message is, first of all, as a warning to us who hold to the truth. But it is also in an attempt to arrest maybe some who are going astray. And it is a call, and, and, and I don't want you to go away and say, well, you know, he was ranting and raving about the media. No, the point is, it's a call to get back to God. That is the whole point of this chapter. That's the whole point of these three chapters. Remember, chapters 7, 8, and 9 of Isaiah are messianic chapters. They point to Jesus, particularly chapter 7 and chapter 9 and 8 is sandwiched in between them. And we're going to touch very briefly on, on chapter 9 this morning. And so the point is, and, the, and, and, I, and I trust that I can bring the point across this morning, and that is that the central character in this chapter is God. Now I'm going to give you the list of characters and uh, the... Um, the, 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 the historic background to this. So the, the central character has to be God. And, and again, I've been blessed by the, 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 the readings in the book of Psalms this morning and last week also. And if you read the, the psalm that we read this morning, I think it was 59, if you read it again, you'll see that, I, that David's look, uh, David is looking to the Lord. He is not looking to his military might. He's not looking to his brave men. He, he's not looking to Egypt. He's not looking to other nations. He is looking to the Lord. I look to the, to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. That's the, that's the point, and that's the point of the passage. All right, th then there's Isaiah, who, who's an important figure in this whole thing. Isaiah is a prophet. Uh, his name means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. He speaks primarily to Judah. Remember that Israel is now divided into two kingdoms. Judah with their capital in Jerusalem and Israel with their capital in Samaria. Now when we speak about Samaria today and when you read about Samaria in these chapters, it's not meaning Samaria in the way that we read Samaria in the New Testament. Remember that something happened in between. Uh, Israel was carried away in captivity, and uh, Assyria put their own people into the area of Samaria, and there was intermarriage, and they formed their own religion, and they were not pure Jews, um, and that was the context of Samaria in the New Testament. This is, not, this is before that all happened. So Samaria is the capital of Israel with its king, and the kings are mentioned here. I'm not going to get into the kings. Then there is Syria. Syria is where modern-day Syria is, to the north of Israel, with the capital of Damascus in the passage. Syria is not part of Israel, not part of the people of God. But at this time, Syria and Israel, the northern tribes, had formed an alliance against Judah, against Jerusalem. And so that's that's the background. Now, there's a final player in this whole story, which we're not really going to see in this chapter, but when you, and I trust you'll go home and read these first chapters of Isaiah. 
The, the other player is Assyria. Assyria is not the same Assyria. Assyria is, would relate to become Babylon, which today is Iraq. Um, Assyria was an um, ascending world power, uh, far more powerful than Syria and Israel and Judah together. And God would use Assyria to deal with Israel and to deal with Judah, and Israel would later be carried into captivity uh, by the Assyrians. All right, now that, that's the background. So let's look at this section, and I'm going to go almost verse for verse from, chapter, from verse 11. And, um, <clears throat> sorry, verse 12. And of course, here we have an inflammatory word, conspiracy. The previous message I, sp I spoke on this, as I said, 18 months ago, deals with the issue of conspiracy. Was there a conspiracy? Yes, there was a conspiracy. Israel, the northern tribes, had conspired with the enemy, with Syria, to attack Judah. So there was a conspiracy. But why does God say, don't say a conspiracy? Concerning all that this people call a conspiracy. Because there is something greater than the conspiracy. And that is God. You see, the problem with Israel, you, you, notice the, the last line in that verse, nor be afraid of their threats. The whole idea of conspiracies and conspiracy theories, and, and I recognize there's a difference between conspiracies and conspiracy theories, but, but the whole point of them is to generate fear. And here's one of the problems we have today, is that Christians, churches, and pastors, and nations are acting out of fear rather than out of a sound mind. One of the verses that has become very important to me recently is that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Where do I get a sound mind? I get it from the Word of God. That's the only place you're going to get sound, a sound mind. You're going to get the right information. You're not going to get it anywhere else. But the problem is that, that we, we are so concerned, and churches and pastors and teachers are so concerned with all of these conspiracies. Oh, where does, the, where does COVID come from? Where does, uh, the, the vaccine is this, the, you know, if the vaccine is that, it's this problem, it's that problem. Oh, it's an opportunity for governments to take control. Yes, there is a conspiracy. And there is a conspirator. And his name is the devil. And he's, he is behind all of these things. But in saying then that there is a conspiracy against the church, we are ignoring the fact that God is on our side. And that our eyes need to be fixed on Him and not on the conspiracies. And I'm, I'm not getting into whether the, which of the conspiracies are true and false. Because folks, here's the problem. At the end of the day, they don't matter. They don't matter because we have God. And we need to see him more than we see. But here's, here's exactly the problem. We spend more time, and Christians and pastors are spending more time studying the conspiracies than they are spending studying the Word of God. That's the problem. And so don't be focused on the conspiracy. Don't be afraid of their threats. Nor be troubled. Because God is in control. Folk, if, if you listen to Christians today, and if you listen to the media today, it, China is in control. The virus is in control. The liberals are in control. Everybody is in control except God. But God is in control. And don't be afraid. I'm not saying don't be stupid. I'm not saying be careless. And of course, we do everything that we can to protect ourselves against the virus and against the, 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 the threats. And, and, and remember that the threats are not just from the virus. There are, there are other problems. And this is the problem, is that the virus, folk, and hear me, the, the virus is the least of the church's problems today. We have far bigger problems than the virus. And we have far bigger problems than government 
uh, overreach. And I don't believe we have government overreach in California. Our problem is a lukewarmness and a lack of relationship with God and a lack of the preaching of the gospel from the pulpit. Don't be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, you shall make holy. It's the Lord of hosts. Notice who Isaiah says. He doesn't say Jesus meek and mild. The Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of heaven. He is the one that we need to fear. Let him be your dread. I think you can begin to see the problem here. Christians are more afraid of the virus and of the vaccine and of the government than they are of God. And when we fear God, we, we, we don't fear anything else because our fear of God overrides anything else. Folk, we need to get God back into our into his proper place in our hearts and in our minds and in our thinking. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. There's a contradiction, isn't there? And yet this is part of the message of Isaiah. There are these two things. And remember, Paul speaks about the same idea in the book of Romans. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. There's two sides to God. There are two aspects to his nature. There is his goodness and his severity. He is a sanctuary, but he is a stone of stumbling. Remember, Peter quotes this concerning Jesus, that Jesus is that stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. What he is depends on where you are at. If you're on the wrong side, he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. If you're on the wrong side, he is your judge. If you are on the right side, he is your sanctuary, your place of safety and of refuge. He is your savior. And folk... We can never separate these two ideas. And, and it's, it's not like God is schizophrenic, that he has two personalities. This is just who God is. And it's entirely up to you as to which part or which aspect, and I know we're talking in you know, trying to simplify very complex things, but which part of God is relevant to you? You need to decide, are you going to be on the side of being stumbled? Or are you going to be on the side of being sheltered? And so he will be as a sanctuary and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, so Judah and Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's strange thinking, isn't it? God is a trap and a snare. We can argue about where the virus comes from. And in our arguments, we forget that God is in control. And that God has allowed it. Now, I know there are Christians who have a big problem with that idea because they never even thought about that possibility. Because we're so worried about, is it China or is it, is it a, a lab-created thing or is it a natural? Does it come from bats? Does it come from wherever? We're more concerned about that than saying, no, hang on. God has permitted this. And why has he permitted it? He has permitted it to test his church. Just like he allows everything else to test us. And unfortunately, many have failed the test and they become a, entrapped and ensnared by the Lord, in a sense. And many among them shall stumble. 
and they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. I spoke a few years ago about the great falling away. It's exactly where we are right now. There is a great falling away. I've forgotten the number. Here's, here's something interesting, just by the way. Here's a sidebar. You know that in this last year, evangelicalism has grown in America by a staggering number. Yeah, you can frown. You say, that's not possible. Yes, indeed, it has happened. Why? Not because people have got saved, but because they joined the political party called the Evangelical Church. Think about that. Very few people are getting saved. No churches are reporting numbers of people getting saved, but they're reporting people joining. There's a difference between God adding us to the church and joining the church because they are, it's politically expedient or because we like the ideas that the church is propagating as far as politics is concerned. What a desperate time that the church is growing, the so-called church is growing because of its political position, not because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the process, many are stumbling and many are broken and snared and taken. And again, you, you have to take my word for this. I could, I could bore you and, I, and it's not edifying for hours and hours and I can name names and I can go down the list of friends of mine who've turned aside from the faith in recent months, literally, in recent years of churches that have wholesale for, forsaken the gospel and simply become another wing of the Republican Party. And folk, I'm not against Re the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Here, here's the problem. You, you're going to say, because when I get to the names, you're going to say, but brother, you, you're only mentioning the right wing. But that's the problem. We don't have a problem with the left wing. You say, but what about, the, what about liberalism? What about abortion? What about these things? That's not our problem. That is not what is, what, is, what is affecting the church. The church understands the problems of the left wing. But they don't understand the problems of the right wing. Which has just as many problems and in fact is worse because it's more subtle. We don't recognize. You say, well, who should I vote for? You should know the answer by now. Vote for Jesus. I'm not saying don't have an opinion. But what is, your, what is your focus? Where is your hope? Who is going to save? I, I, I saw someone sent me a video last night and I looked at it and it, it deeply disturbed me. This woman was crying. Because she says, bring back my president. Because he's going to save us. He's going to save the world. Folk, there is no president that can save the world. There is no president who can save America. There is only one who can save, and that's Jesus Christ. And when we go after these, the, these men, doesn't matter who they are, whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever you like, they are not God. But we've made them our God. Because we look to them for our salvation. We look to them for the salvation of America. We look to them, even worse, for the salvation of the church. And one of them has claimed that I saved the church in America. It's on record. Many are stumbling. Here's a, the thought changes here. And it gets even darker. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. What is he saying? He's saying close the book. Lock it away. Is that possible that God says my word needs to be closed? Yes, it is. 
There's, a, there's, a, there's fine print in that verse. I'm gonna, I'll get back to that. But remember Isaiah chapter 6, when God called Isaiah. And Isaiah says, I will go and preach. And God says, here's your message. You should know by now what that message is. Go and tell them, hearing they will not hear. Seeing they will not see. They will not understand. Basically because they've rejected me, the Lord says, I will blind them. Remember Jesus quotes these words over and over in the New Testament. They ask him, well, why don't you speak plainly? And Jesus says, it's a waste of time to speak plainly to them. Because hearing they will not hear and seeing they will not see. Close the book. And folk, the word of God has become closed to the churches in America. And I'm not talking about tradition. I'm not talking about Anglican churches and Methodist churches. They lost it long ago. I'm talking about evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic churches who've always preached the gospel. But today they're not preaching the gospel. They're preaching another message. And the word of God is closed. And you speak to these men and you say, what about the word of God? It's a closed book for them. They cannot understand. They cannot see. We're in a desperate place. But here's the good news. Seal the law among my disciples. So to those who are not disciples, the book is closed. There is a blindness that has come upon the church. But the true disciples still have the word. They still understand. And the question is, am I a disciple? And remember the and it's interesting that he uses this word disciple. Remember, a disciple is a follower, a learner. Am I a follower and a learner of Jesus? I need to rush on because there is just so much in this passage that I really want to share with you, but we have limited time. And in fact, I was speaking to uh, my friend. On Friday, and I said, you know, I, 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 would, I would love to preach through the whole of the book of Isaiah because there is just so much here. But the church will not bear it. Can you imagine sitting under this kind of ministry week after week after week? Now, I know I'm losing friends today. I'm serious about that. I understand. I know I may lose some of you today when I start naming the names. But I'm prepared for that. But I don't have, I admit it freely, I don't have the courage to preach through Isaiah. It's too hard. It's too hard. But he says, I will wait on the Lord. I will wait on the Lord. Who hides his face from the house of Jacob. See, there's the same idea again. He hides his face from Israel. And I will hope in him. Folk, I'm not hearing preachers say our hope is in the Lord. But our hope is in this political party or that political party. Our hope is in the church rising up against the government. Our hope is in the Supreme Court. Our hope is in this and that and the other thing. But everything except the Lord. And I trust that you've got the message that, in, that over these last 18 months, these last two years, I've reminded you over and over from the very beginning, let's get our eyes on Jesus. Our hope is in Him. Our hope is not in anything else. Because everything else will fail. Here am I, verse 18, and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs, and this is quoted again in Hebrews chapter 2. We are for signs and wonders in Israel, from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. What is he saying? He's saying, here am I, and he has two sons, and my two children. The Lord has given them to me, and we're a sign. He's saying two important things. The first is that the Lord gave him his sons. And his hope is in the Lord. But the future lies in his sons. 
Folk, the future does not lie in the broad way out there, the religious broad way. The hope lies in those children, spiritual children that God has given us. The ones and the twos. Those few who have been saved in these last couple of years. That's where my hope is. And I'll be honest, I have little hope for the old God. Because we become so established in our religion. And we become hard to the things of God. But I'm encouraged by the new believers who have a zeal for the things of God. Who love the Lord Jesus, who's still grateful for their salvation. Who eat up the word of God. You heard one of our brothers recently who's not with us this morning because he's gone away for a wedding. Say that in the eight months before he got baptized, between when he got saved and he got baptized, he's read through the whole of the Bible. Now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I wonder how many of us here this morning who have been saved for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years have read through the whole Bible. Our hope is in the children that God is giving us. But more than that, these two sons had names. And I need to refer to my notes because they are hard names. The first son, or in fact the second son, his name is Maher Shalahel Hashbaz. Now there's a good name to give your next child. Maher Shalahel Hashbaz. And it literally means speed to the spoil, hasten to the booty. What a name. I'll get back to that in a moment. The firstborn son is Shir Yashab. Shir Yashab. And his name means a remnant shall return. Hasten to the spoil. Referring to Assyria, who would run with speed to spoil Israel and Syria, and so allow Judah to escape. God will judge, but a remnant will return. This speaks prophetically of a long way in the future when Judah will be carried away in captivity and a remnant will return. And folk, that's true for us today. God will judge swiftly. Through whatever means he chooses, whether it's Assyria or whatever means he chooses, he will judge those who are compromised. But there will be a remnant. Hope is in the Lord. And he's promised that he always will have a remnant. The question simply is, am I part of that remnant? Now remember the warnings that I've given you before. Let's not be arrogant. Let's not call ourselves a remnant church because I don't know, I don't believe we can call ourselves that. Don't call yourself a part of the remnant because that's arrogant. All we can do is say, Lord, I hope that I'm part of that remnant. And that I'm not part of that which you, are, which you are judging. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Reminds me of Saul, that when Saul had fallen from grace, He went to visit the witch of Endor, that she might call up the prophet, seeking mediums and wizards. And you say, well, brother, that doesn't apply to us today because I don't see, I don't see Christians, I'm not seeing pastors go to the, uh, to the um, what do they call these guys on every street corner? The palm readers, to the psychics. 
And some are, and some read their horoscopes. I hope you don't. But folks, there's a principle here. The principle is in the last part of the verse. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? He's saying, why are you going to the dead to get advice as to how to deal with the conspiracy, how to deal with the attack and the assault? Shouldn't you be asking God? And here's where the message gets hairy. Christians and pastors are no longer consulting God. They're consulting Fox TV. And One American Network. And Breitbart. And somebody had to help me with a list because I don't know these names. Newsmax. Facebook. Tucker Carlson. A man that I believe is demon-possessed. Sean Hannity. Breitbart. My pillow guy. Laura Ingram, and the list goes on and on and on. These are the counselors that are forming the thinking of the Christian church in America today. And you say, oh, but some of them are Christians. The book of Corinthians warns us that the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. Corinthians, Ephesians, and Revelation remind us that liars are not saved. And these men are liars. So how can they be saved? How can they be Christians? And even if they are Christians, they're not speaking according to the law. They're speaking according to their own wisdom. And the source of their information at the end of the day is QAnon, and I'm not going to get into that. Thank God for our brother who's got saved out of QAnon. But folks, this, is, this is, forms the basis of preaching. And I've told you in the last couple of weeks, I listen to messages, six, seven messages, sometimes more every week. Different preachers in different places in different countries. And there's one commonality, and that is that they've not got their information from the Word of God. They're getting their information from Fox TV. And you say, well, what about CNN? Christians are not affected by CNN. But they are by Fox TV. In fact, here's the problem. He says, why do you say seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter? Folk, we have a speaking God. Hebrews chapter 1, we saw this recently, that, that God has spoken through His Son. He is not like the dumb idols, Paul says to the Corinthians. Who cannot speak? God speaks. And He speaks through His Word and He speaks through His Spirit. And yet, Christians spend more time in front of the television listening to Fox News than they do in the Word of God. And the same applies to preachers. And you wonder why they're not preaching the Word of God, but they're preaching conspiracies. And they're preaching everything else but the Word of God. And it's a rhetorical question, should not a people seek their God? Fuck, I am horrified by friends of mine. How little, uh, how little idea, how, how, how clueless they are as to the Christian response to the virus and to legislation and to the government. And you say, well, the Bible doesn't speak about COVID. It doesn't speak about COVID, but it speaks about our attitude and our response to these things. And I believe that as a Christian and I believe as a church, we can and we have formulated a plan of action and a policy which is based purely on the Word of God and not based on what does, what's going on on the news. Now, I know the response. I had this response in this last week. I was part of a group on Facebook of several hundred Christians, and the idea was that people are posting encouraging messages. And then somebody posted a conspiracy thing. 
And I responded and I said, what use is this to us as Christians? How does it edify us was my question. And the response from the moderator was, we need to know what's going on. That's always the excuse. You've got to watch these things so you know what's going on. Folk, I don't need to know what's going on. I need to know what God is doing. I need to know what God is saying. And you know that I, am, that, that I watch the news avidly. That I read widely. I have a good idea as to what's going on in the world. But at the end of the day, my thinking cannot be shaped by the world. It must be shaped by the word of God. My responses cannot be dictated to me by Sean Hannity. My responses must be dictated by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of Christ. How do we deal with brothers who come in amongst us, who have a different view to what we have on politics or on abortion even? How do we deal with that? The Scriptures tell us how to deal with that. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Folk, there are good pastors out there. And I know a few of them. And all of them have the same complaint. And that is that their people generally are listening to the media more than they're listening to the pastor. They're listening more to what the news has to say than they're listening to the Word of God. No, let's get back to the law and to the testimony. Let's get back to the Word of God. And I want to challenge you. Spend more time reading and meditating on the Word of God than you spend watching the news. Particularly national news. If they do not speak according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. Folks, it's that simple. It's that simple. And I can spend another five hours explaining to you how that these guys are saying stuff that is contrary to the Word of God. That churches and church organizations are saying stuff that is contrary to the Word of God. And if they are saying that, then there is no light in them. They are in darkness. And here's a theme that he's going to begin to pick up now, and I need to rush. Verse 22. I'm skipping over verse 21 because I want to draw to a close. Then they will look to the earth. And see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. I don't know that I need to explain that verse to you. That's where the church is today. Where are they looking? When these things begin to happen, what must we do? Look up. For your redemption draws near. But where are Christians looking? They're looking to the earth. They're looking to governments. They're looking to the news media. They're looking to everywhere else, but they except looking up. They're looking down. And what will they see? They will see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish. And they will be driven into the very thing that they're looking at. No wonder we are in darkness. No wonder there is, as in verse 20, there is no light in the church anymore. The church doesn't have a message anymore to the world because it's just parroting the world's message with a bit of a Christian spin on it. Here's the good news. And this is a wonderful thing about Isaiah is that it's got the good news and the bad news all together. Here's the good news. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them light has shined. What's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. 
He is that light that shines in a dark place. Now remember again, I said to you that these things happened as examples to them. They were examples to us. They happened to them as examples to us. And the message of Isaiah is, God is done with Israel, but Jesus is coming. And he has a remnant. And folk, I've said to you that we're in exactly the same place as Judah and Israel was then. Not just in terms of where we are spiritually and politically. But Jesus is coming again. And just as they stood before the coming of Jesus the first time, yes, it was 700 years still from Isaiah's prophecies that Jesus would come. I don't believe we're 700 years from Jesus' second return. But all of what Isaiah says is in the light of the fact that there is a light shining. And that light is growing brighter and brighter every day. Those who have their eyes fixed upon darkness and upon this world will go into greater darkness. But those who have their eyes fixed on the light of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will get into, will see more and more light. And then verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. Folk, at the end of the day, and, and hear me, I don't care who's in the White House. Because the government is on his shoulder. He is the king. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Judah was discussing the possibility of going down to Egypt to get Egypt to come and help them. They were worried about what's Assyria going to do? What is Syria going to do? What is the King of Israel going to do to us? But there is a light. And folk, we need to have our eyes fixed on that light. And his name is Jesus. And he's coming. And he's preparing a bride. And he's purging his threshing floor. And he's cleansing it of those that are compromised. Of those who are half-hearted. Of those who are more into the world than they are into him. And when he comes, he will set up his kingdom. I fear for the next few years in America. I believe that it's going to get harder and harder. It's going to get worse and worse as we get to the next election, presidential elections. The church is going to be rent asunder in the next presidential elections. But unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder. Folk, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a Christian. I'm not looking for a solution from Washington because Washington has no solutions. I'm looking for Jesus, who is the answer to every need, to every problem. But the question is, where are we looking? Where are we getting our advice from? Where are we what, what is shaping our thinking? What is shaping our values? Is it the law and the testimony? Or is it the dead? Spiritually dead. Are we consulting them to advise us how we need to act? Father, we pray that you'd help us. Lord, these are hard words. And Lord, I know that there are some who probably have tuned out already on, online. And there may be some here in the audience here this morning who are angry with me because I've taken an axe to their idols. But Lord, we pray that you'd help us, that we might see Jesus, that we might see him and him alone, and Lord, that the, that, the, that the church may point to us as they did to me recently and say, you're of no earthly use because you're too heavenly minded. 
Father, no, I'm not, doing, I'm not a heavenly minded enough. And Lord, as a church, we're not heavenly minded enough. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to have our eyes fixed on Jesus. That we might see that light that is dawning. And Lord, that we may hasten to the day when he will rule and reign and set up his kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Help us, Lord, to guard our minds. Lord, help us to guard our eyes and our ears to the things that we hear. Lord, I pray particularly that you'd help us not to be perpetuating stuff that we've heard from someone else and regurgitating that as truth to others. But Lord, that we may speak your word. Lord, that when we post on Facebook, we may post your word. Lord, for those who are involved in Instagram or any of these other things. Lord, that we may preach your word. And not the stuff of this world. Help us, Lord, to be your people indeed. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray, Lord, that you'd go with us. I pray, Lord, for the many who are away on vacation and other things. Lord, we just pray for them that you would encourage them, bless them. And Lord, bring them to, back to us this next week. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would go with us. Pray that your word would continue to speak to us, Lord. I pray for those who have been upset by my message this morning. Pray, Lord, that you would help them just to think it through and come to a, good, a godly conclusion. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.